So today we're going to do a quick video about composite versus S video. Now I think most people who end up watching this video are already going to be pretty familiar with the connectors and have an understanding of what the differences between the two of these two interfaces is. So what we're going to do instead is have a look at the two of them on the oscilloscope and we're going to talk about the problems which S video was designed to solve. While I was putting together a different video, I noticed an example of the exact problem in question. This is a capture of the 16x9 Philips pattern, which many people in Europe will of course recognize. It is coming from a composite source, and we have some coloration on the diagonal lines and in the corner circles, which isn't supposed to be there. Now this isn't really all that surprising, because the diagonal lines were put there to frustrate composite color decoders. So let's go and have a look at the oscilloscope and see what's going on here. First of all, our composite video signal. We are presently looking at this part of the pattern, and we can see that we have a monochrome signal, which is just a DC voltage representing brightness or luminance. But in areas where there is color, that DC voltage is mixed with an AC voltage, which happens to be a modulated signal, the color subcarrier. Now, it is all well and good when they two are easy to distinguish like this, but let's go down to those diagonal lines. And what we have here is basically an AC signal, which is supposed to be representing oscillation between black and white, but it is rather similar to the color subcarrier, which normally would represent color. And this is the big number one problem with composite video. To make things worse, luminance and chrominance actually overlap in the frequency domain. The two are arranged such that their energy is concentrated at intervals, kind of like two opposing cones. In this diagram, the luminance tails off around about the center of the color subcarrier, and that is probably a typical scenario. However, there is no reason why it can't just keep on going, providing even more horizontal resolution. And certainly for some PAL variants, anything up to about 6 MHz was possible, and potentially even higher for a direct connection. Now, the optimum way to separate them is to use a comb filter. But the theory behind comb filters is pretty complicated, so I think we're going to skip that one today. Now, not all televisions have an optimum or correctly adjusted comb filter. In the case of older or cheaper sets, they probably don't even have one at all, instead relying on some cruder technique to separate the signals, which of course leads to compromises on picture quality. To try and visually demonstrate what I'm talking about, I've put together a couple of test cards which will clearly show the differences between composite and S-video. And specifically, we're going to be using the zone plate. It is essentially a sinusoid of gradually increasing frequency emanating out from a central point. Now, it's not a feature that you would find very often in a television test card. And here is an actual example in this test card by Snell and Wilcox. And yeah, this is a pretty evil test card and very unlikely to be decoded correctly. This test card here is one of the ones I made for PAL, and I've decided to call it Zone Plate Hell. And I also did an NTSC version, by the way. It's a little bit different. Now, these will be an absolute nightmare for a color decoder, because what we basically end up with is a sinusoid of constantly changing frequency, which inevitably will cross over with the color subcarrier. There is pretty much no chance that even the best television would be able to display it without unwanted chrominance artifacts. And at the top and bottom, we have some color bars just to prove that the color decoding is actually working for the S-Video test. My usual CRT TV, unfortunately, doesn't support S-Video at all. So for this test, I've picked up this Tesco own brand LCD TV from my local recycling center. And I didn't even have to fix it. It just worked. And it actually has an S-Video input, which we need for this test. Now, to generate the test pattern, I'm using a professional PC video I.O. And with this thing, we can have a frame buffer in recommendation 601 format, which is pretty well standard for analog test cards. And in terms of the actual outputs, we can have it any way we like it. Composite, S-Video, RGB, component, HDMI, the whole lot. So this is a really nice setup for doing these sorts of tests. Okay, so first of all, our PAL test here. And far from the static image that we were expecting, what we actually have is blinking psychedelic colors of madness. There's actually two different things going on here. So number one is that at the edges of the zone plates where the frequency is close to the color subcarrier, we do of course see this spontaneous color. And the other thing is we have this animated effect that's really funky. So what's happening there is this is a beat pattern which occurs between the oscillator in the color decoder and the input signal. So next, let's have a look at this video because I do also have that connected. 
these buttons are really very sticky. I have to press them quite hard. There we go. Yeah, so really significant difference there, and the S video signal is basically perfect. I mean, there's, it's not just a case that S video is a little bit better, it just completely resolved that problem. I do also have HDMI connected here as well, so I guess we should also try that. Um, come on. There we go. Pretty similar, but I would say that looks a little bit worse actually. The contrast is just not quite as nice with the HDMI test, so that's a pretty interesting result. And I guess maybe this is just something to do with the implementation in this particular TV. Anyway, that's our PAL test over. So I guess the next thing to look at is NTSC. So I'll just have to go over to my computer and change the test pattern. So this is our NTSC test, and I made a number of changes to the NTSC test card. The zone plates are larger, and that's so that we end up with a lower frequency. Otherwise, it won't interfere with the... NTSC color subcarrier, and I only have the color bars at the bottom on this one just because there's just less space to work with. But kind of an interesting result. It's kind of similar. Um, we've in these areas where we saw the colors for the PAL version, we instead have this smudgy flickering, which is just a very, very faint blue. And the shade of blue seems to vary depending on which TV I tried it on. Uh, it seems to be a, a bit stronger on another TV that I've got. Um, anyway, let's try the uh, S video now and see what we end up with. Oops. Uh, yeah, and once again, it just completely resolves that problem. It looks pretty much perfect now. And just for belt and braces, we'll do the uh, HDMI as well. Yeah, really good. I know, certainly to my eye, once again, the contrast is a little duller than the S-Video test, but otherwise, perfect. So there you have it. S-Video versus Composite. Now, S-Video is a pretty nice interface, and if you have it available to you, then definitely worth using. And now, the obvious question here is, how does S-Video manage to make such a difference? Well, let's have a look on the oscilloscope. Uh, the yellow trace is the Y or luminous channel, and the blue trace is the C or chrominous channel. Uh, the signal that we're looking at here is the zone plate hell test card. Specifically, we're looking at the zone plates. And notice that the chrominous channel is inactive. But if we move down to the lines containing the color bars, it springs to life. And basically, it is completely unambiguous to the TV that the zone plates are monochrome and the color bars are actual color. Anyway, I hope this clears up any confusion about what exactly S video was supposed to improve. And that is all for this video. So thanks for watching.